I want to start with you, Excellency. Um, you've spent the last couple of days discussing all of these things, the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. This is pretty dry stuff. Indeed. <laughs> 17 goals. How many targets? 169. 169. 169. How many indicators? Not yet. 300 plus. So it's going to grow. <laughs> 300 plus. <laughs> yeah. So what conclusions have you come to? Um, good morning, everyone. And it's quite um, pleasant to be here today. Um, what I wanted to say that we have built a couple of sessions, um, what we call the SDG in Action, started on the 9th and the 10th, uh, second one. And uh, I always think of the uh, 17 goals as uh, buckets, and then we have to group the buckets together. So we converted them to clusters, and we had the best of minds to talk, discuss, um, and challenge one another, and to come up with the ideas and solutions. And in these, uh, in these sessions or cluster that we had, it was not about people who are part of the UN or the financial systems. We had the best brains in innovation. We had different constituencies. We had philanthropists. We have NGOs. And uh, within all of this work together, uh, we come up with some suggestion uh, going forward. But the driver of these two sessions that we had and the six uh, um, clusters is predominantly two areas. One, this is a natural question once the SDGs were, were posted. Um, first, first is how on earth are we going to finance this? Mm -hmm. What are the tools? Are we going to think the same way we thought before with the MDGs? And then secondly is how can we keep ourselves on track? So reporting and monitoring. And these are the brilliant ideas that came out in terms of su suggestion. Right. So with the panel that we have here, we have a perfect opportunity to see how the SDGs come into play. Because you have the United Nations, there's no longer any argument over what the goals are, is there? No, uh, we have uh, the goals, uh, 17, as you said, but they are covering a broader agenda than we have ever had before. The Millennium Development Goals, the early generation goals were quite different. Now we have goals that cover energy, transport, agriculture. So this is much wider and it also requires the assistance from not only the United Nations and many governments, but also private sector and the civil society and the academic and scientific community. It requires government to implement, prime minister to go from global to national. You have to come up with policies to make them work. I would be surprised if there is any country, any government worth, worth its salt that hasn't um, ingrained in its policies the need to end poverty, need for resilient infrastructure, the need to have equitable education, the need for gender equality. So this is a global common sense approach that any country aspiring to be a, a progressive society needs to have already in, in, its, in its national policies. How far, when you are setting your manifesto and when you are inviting your, or not inviting, you're telling your cabinet what you expect of them, are you now going to include the SDGs as part of that remit? Well, the, 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 the good thing, at least for us as a country, is that the SDGs reflect what we stand for, reflect our values as a country, reflect what our people aspire to achieve. So they are of no surprise. We cannot find one single contradiction in what the SDGs are aiming for. So at least for our country, it's relatively easy. What I think is extremely important is that globally, as a global community, we abandon the somewhat paternalistic approach of the MDGs. You need to do this. You need to do that. I think that that prescriptive approach is counterproductive. And, okay, the and replace it with what? Well, I think the SDGs are already replacing that. Legend has it that the MDGs were drafted in some UN basement by a number of men. SDGs came up from the grassroots uh, with, with a number, hundreds, I believe, if not thousands of consultation meetings and grassroots meetings. So there is definitely a change in approach, a more listening mode. And I think that's crucial to get this delivered. Well, I agree with the Prime Minister. The uh, process of getting the SDGs was much more democratic 
much more inclusive than the MDGs. At, um, you know, the MDGs, when they started, they were basically based on advice of wise men, and one of them is here with us. Uh, but the SDGs are very much based on some good interaction, not just with governments, but with civil society, with the private sector. But we have major challenges. First, with your first question about the role of government. Here, the assumption that we're not just talking about the role of national governments or federal governments, but we're talking about four levels of government, from the authorities, the local councils, to national governments, to responsibility of regional arrangements, to global governance as well. So, Sheikh, how, how significant, uh, Excellency, how significant is it that you get started early? I mean, it goes through till 2030. The temptation is to say, well, we've got plenty of time to have a think about this. Uh, let's set up a commission, maybe have an investigation. Uh, that will report back sometime next year. Uh, and we'll discuss it in a white paper. Um, a couple of things. <laughs> One, I also would like to add to, to my colleagues here, um, when you talk about the SDGs, you're not talking about yourself as a government and your people. Um, there are some of the countries as well who are um, countries that are donors helping other countries. So when you put in your strategy development and helping out uh, other countries, you have to keep in mind not just about fulfilling the SDGs for yourself as a country, but how you help other countries to eradicate themselves from uh, so a level of poverty. Do? So for us, most important part, and I, I, I have to say I'm a techie, I come from computer engineering backgrounds, and for me, when you look at the project, um, close monitoring is very, very crucial. That's a critical path. If you don't look at this uh, on yearly basis, if you don't look at this and see all of us together um, that we, we are on track and we're not skewing because after five years you'll find yourself with a gap and a delta that you don't want to. And think and consider if you're looking at this in 15 years' time. Richard, you asked why it is urgent. Uh, and I think you should remember the word sustainability. Sustainability goes through all the goals, and it also connects to the climate change agreement that was reached in Paris. And we are really, have, we have to move faster and do everything sustainably today. And also understand that if we are to, to make it, we got to mobilize now. And I'm very impressed that we have had this meeting here. This is one of the first occasions after five weeks of the first year implementation, we're already talking about how we translate that to the national level. And we are in a hurry. Also, if you look at the, uh, the world looks today with the horrible war in Syria and crisis all around us, and the pessimism that is coming there, we need to set a direction, set an agenda, set a vision, and the SDGs will give us the vision, and now it's for us to take the steps to reach that goal. For some people, 2030 may look far, but with the kind of goals that we have, eradication of extreme poverty, ending um, uh, malnutrition problems, having issues to do with the quality of education, all of that required us to start now. We have been talking here in this um, conference about the benefits of industrial revolution number four. Many people in the world didn't even benefit from the second industrial revolution about access to electricity. So we have real problems that we need to start Immediately. Well, Prime Minister, unless you have greater ambitions that we don't yet know about and still intend to be in power in 2030, um, <laughs> anything you'd like to tell us on that score? No, no, no. Um, <laughs> Definitely not. The, the challenge for somebody like yourself, a Prime Minister who's going to face an election sooner rather than later with goals in 2030, is to say, yes, those millennium, those uh, sustainable goals, the SDGs, we'll deal with them on the way. No, I, I would disagree in the sense that w what is basically um, written in, in, in that agreement is something that makes sense now. But how are you going to do it? We are doing it. What, what is wrong with having affordable energy? So we need to invest, and we are investing in renewables. We are cutting our energy bills. We are providing, at least in our country, free childcare to all those families who opt to have uh, working parents. I think that the, the real challenge is not for one single country to adopt and move forward but to adopt a more sort of global social mobility 
um, uh, program. Oh, in, wishy washy uh, language. Not there at from all. A politician. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. I will give you a very, uh, one very concrete example. The issue is to have aid going to um, countries to get them off the aid. It's about, I would popularize the, the issue of the, the, the concept of SDGs as creating a global middle class. So, right now, in our mindset, in our national mindset, it's obvious that for a country to move forward, you need to create a very solid middle class. Mm -hmm. We need a global middle class that doesn't exist so far. We have a world of inequalities. No one is tackling this until now on a global level. This is the first time, and it's shocking that we had to wait until 2015 to have this sort of convergence that we should move together to create a global middle class. Yeah. I'm always the, uh, the optimist. First of all, I, what I want to say that... How do you uh, keep being optimistic in the good face energy. of such, of such <laughs> crises? We have a very optimistic prime minister. He's our role model. <laughs> <laughs> Cheat shot. No, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm a, again, I'll go back to being a technologist. I worked at Dubai Ports. They, there's a testimony for that work. Right. Um, what I want to say... Uh, the tools we have today, compared to what we had before, makes it much easier to deliver. Uh, and just by being in the summit and meeting a, a lot of bright minds with a lot of innovation, new innovation tools, and when I talk about tools, it's not just about technology. I mean, the idea is, what we have done is we've looked at a lot of the uh, business models and that they're being disrupt uh, disrupted with new technology and innovation. So reaching out to deliver the goals is much uh, feasible today and realistic than the MDGs because we have the, uh, the smart tools today to deliver and the technology keep changing. The other side is uh, the 17 are, uh, goals are not silos. Every no. time you deliver one, you'll be feeding um, almost all the other goals indirectly. So I, that in itself I means... Wonder, yeah. Because of this, because everybody talks about the 17 goals, you win on one, you win on the others, you lose on one. That it's a matrix in many ways. It is, uh, it is a cube. But do you risk setting up an entire panoply of mechanisms and reporting and monitoring and that it becomes, it becomes an empire in itself? just monitoring and dealing with the SDGs? Well, maybe 20 years ago you would say that it's hard to monitor, but I think with the technology we have today um, and the minds and the connectivity, we can, we can monitor. We're spending a lot of money on this as a global uh, society, as individual countries. And I think it's obvious that one needs to examine where we're achieving success and where the failures and the pitfalls are. In order to do that, you need reporting mechanisms. And I think it's now, I think that you did the cheap shot right now <laughs> in saying that why should we need the reporting mechanisms? Can you imagine one decent corporation that doesn't have uh, reporting not, mechanisms? I so let, al suggesting. let alone trillions of taxpayers' money that need to be reported back and be spent better. Good try, Prime Minister, but I am not <laughs> suggesting... Trying my best. I am not suggesting that you don't have to have uh, reporting and KPIs and, and all those other things. I am suggesting that you, uh, you, you risk losing the, the, the wood for the trees. You start to lose your way because you've got so much of this. You've been trying to get in, Doctor. Well, the, the, the basics of reporting that you need really to have something that you have done in order to report on, and you need really to have some data uh, for that. I, I'm afraid that we don't really have the luxury of talking about that for a good number of countries. When we are talking about eradication of extreme poverty, for instance, we have 85 countries members of the United Nations and members of the World Bank, we don't have a clue about what they have been doing for more than 15 years. They don't collect data and we're using proxies for them. So the issue here is basically how to build the databases, the indicators, and to feed them. But that data is one. We have an issue of finance, and it's not just about the government's finance and the uh, official uh, assistance that's coming from overseas or from development agencies, but how to get the private sector in. And definitely you have a challenge of the implementation because even in some of the advanced and sophisticated societies, the kind of demands of implementation and integrated approach, getting the private sector in and the civil society is a challenge. You know, well, I think we should recall that we are 
right now in, in the situation where we change the whole paradigm, the, the whole way of thinking on development. I was around for the MDGs 15 years ago. It was mostly about official development assistance, relationship donors to recipient countries. Now we have a dynamic approach which brings in the relationship between the different sectors. This new way of thinking horizontally rather than vertically is almost revolutionary because both as national government, I was myself Foreign Minister of Sweden, and in the UN I've seen the same thing. We work in silos and we don't see the enormous gains of going horizontally. For instance, look, just take water. If you do water right, water and sanitation right, you reduce child mortality, you improve maternal health, you improve education, particularly for girls, by that gender equality, and you reduce also extreme poverty. You reach five goals. If governments were to learn to go across working horizontally, see how the different sectors connect, that's a new paradigm of development. Right. So, let me ask you then, we'll come to you in a moment, actually, yeah. but let me ask you, what needs to change in the mindset of government, or it may already be changing, that will allow that horizontal thinking? To organize in the government a committee that works on the SDGs and connect with the ministers of foreign affairs, development, transport, energy, agriculture, uh, and that we in the United Nations, and I think we have lessons to learn, make sure that we use all our missions, all our agencies, and bring them together around the problem. We should put, Richard, the problem in the center the problem in the center and then gather around it and have a division of labor. Um, a couple of things. One, I would like to add to Eliusen um, that Water had demonstrated uh, uh, five goals across the board. Um, let me add uh, uh, access to energy. Today, with clean energy uh, being cheap, we are, we are able to actually have better access. Once you supply energy, it's very easy to cross a lot of the other, the other parts. Right. The most challenging point is, is uh, the definition of eligibility being um, a country that is poor, and then once you move a little bit further, and all of a sudden you're out of that line. If you do that, how can you sustain it afterward? All right. That's really critical path. Who, That's the critical path. Who is gonna pay for all of this? Everybody. <laughs> everybody who would benefit, everybody who can contribute. And here, again, the model is changing from the MDGs. The MDGs time, it is government finance, and if you don't have the money, you ask other governments to help you, directly or indirectly. This time is different because it is expecting that the private sector is going to be having adequate incentives to get into the business of delivery. And what happens in hard economic times? I'm not suggesting that hard economic times last forever, but there is a global slowdown underway and budgets are stretched. Cutbacks and austerity is everywhere. So now where do these rich company, countries and companies I agree, we're not really enjoying any kind of a benign environment today to encourage the private sector or even governments to be generous. But basically this will get us more seriously about efficiency of spending. This will get us into some certain project that could be very helpful in getting us all out of the, uh, from the crisis. And the investments in human capital, the investments in infrastructure, they are not really making sense for their own sectors, but they are very useful to get us all from crises and their challenges. I would like to go back on what we were saying on how you implement all this. So, I agree there is a need of interministerial committees and all the rest. I'm no big fan of committees. I think that the real big change from the MDGs is social media. Social media in the sense that there is so much more awareness, so much more pressure that governments will need to change their approach because people will expect that they deliver and they do something about it. So I think what has really changed from the MDGs is global awareness and global engagement. The fact that there are so many millions of people around the globe who expect their representatives to do something about it. Do you think that they expect people to do something about it as against their own economic interest? The old line, it's the economy, uh, stupid, as the, as in the last election. Okay. Uh, to, to, to the extent that they want tax cuts, do they want higher government spending on these issues? 
Well, I, I, I don't subscribe to the school of thought that says that tax, tax cuts are um, diametrically opposed to more aid. The sense it's about growing the economy. And I subscribe to the school of thought that says that tax cuts grow the economy. We experience that. The issue is how you grow it. We grow it by tax cuts and we have more budget to help. So when it comes to the SDGs, what contribution do you intend to make externally outside of your own country? Well, um, first internally in the sense that we are one country already affected by the migration flows. So we, we do help um, as a frontier member state in the European Union. But also when it comes to our external aid, we are on the increase. Of course, the numbers for us as the smallest member state in the European Union are relatively small. But they're, they're there and they haven't been uh, higher in our history. The World Bank, are you preparing... What, what programs, because obviously it is all about, as, as the Prime Minister says, it's all about implementation. Yes, but I, I would also add, this is not, with the uh, as a difference from the MDGs, this is not something that some countries need to do. We need to do the reforms internally ourselves. So we need to do more for affordable energy, more for gender equality, more for um, solid infrastructure. So this is not about just investing in other countries, this is about investing in ourselves. In the financing conference for the SDGs, we committed with the multilateral development banks 400 billion for financing in the first three years of implementation. This is not just us, but us and the regional development banks. The importance of this money doesn't really sound that important if you are considering the annual gap, say, of funding when it comes to infrastructure, that we are suffering a gap of like uh, 700 billion to one trillion dollar. It's all about leveraging our money with the private sector. So our idea that in many of the projects, we are not going there alone. We are expecting the private sector to be partners, and we are going to be providing the kind of uh, innovative schemes to get the private sector involved with us and for good rewards and good profits. On this question of, of moving forward, um, Secretary General, the, how, how often do you think that uh, countries should be reporting? How, what should be the collection mechanism of data? And do you subscribe, sir, to a name and shame where it becomes quite clear uh, who are the laggards? That's not a very popular method in the United Nations. We've tried it before. It would be nicer if we could just reward those who uh, do the right thing. But I, I think the reporting is left to the member states. We, I worked on many of us three and a half years on these uh, goals. And I think it was a tremendous achievement that we got them out and that they are so well received. But now, they will only be meaningful if they uh, become realities uh, for the member states. And here, I want to just add one word on the cost. This is an investment. It's good business to do this. If you go, do go for a carbon-free economy, you save a lot of money in the long term. And unfortunately, ministers of finance usually see everything, every dollar as a cost, not as an investment. But I saw one exception in the Republic of Korea. I met the Minister of Finance, and he was so informed about the Sustainable Development Goals. And then I asked why. It turned out that he was not only Minister of Finance, he was also Minister for Strategic Planning. So he had to ask himself, I need to have a longer-term perspective. These SDGs fit my longer-term perspective for building Korea. Which is exactly what the Prime Minister was yeah. saying, that if you follow, would you, would you, would you, would you, yes. Um, this summit is on its fourth year, and then the previous ones were government summits, and today we talk about world government summits. So this place is very fitting yeah. um, for us to discuss the SDG, but going, SDGs, but going forward, I would like to announce, and this is with all our partners, um, we've discussed this, and uh, the, the audience itself reflect the um, multitude of uh, stakeholders, um, that during the summit next year, we'll start, uh, we will start collectively to work on a mechanism for reporting the SDGs. So we'll start it year after year, and we'll use this platform to actually do the reporting for everyone. And we will ramp up this toward the UN. So, wow, that's interesting. Are you telling us that this summit will now become an opportunity for a scorecard on progress of the SDGs. 
I, will I, this be a scorecard? Will we be able to see, not necessarily name and shame, but where we stand? It's, it's like a project manager. You just want to manage um, not skewing from it and focusing. But uh, over and over, you will find that there are new tools, there are new innovation coming up, and that would help. Can, can I just say that we're going to have a meeting in July where we're going to, we asked member states, would you like to report where you are? Yeah. Already 17 nations have turned to us and say, yes, we want to tell you what we've done. And this is now the How first many? month. 17. 17. Out uh, of? Out, out of 193, but they are already now in January telling us yeah, that... Yeah, but it's the 193rd that doesn't want to tell you that I'm interested. Well, they will be under pressure from uh, more than 17, I'll tell you, uh, at that time. So it's, it's, it's a swell of, uh, of uh, people moving in that direction. And this meeting has been very instrumental in bringing other states on board. I've already picked that up. Uh, first of all, Richard, on that, we'll, we are very happy in the World Bank to be supportive and right. we're going to be co-sponsors of the efforts of the government summit and we have an agreement on that already that is being in the making. The second, about your 17, it seems that you are not very satisfied with that. We are in the second month of the implementation. We are being approached now by different countries, not just us in the bank, but the UNDP as well, by many countries asking help and support to formulate the national policies and to prepare for the reporting going forward. But again, it's not all about reporting. And actually what you said about naming and shaming, this will happen. This will happen not from the UN, definitely not from this government summit, not from us, but the data sets are going to be available for everybody. There are going to be think tanks around the world monitoring the progress. They are going to be naming, they are going to be shaming, and they are going to be recognizing success and failure at the same time. It is very healthy to have some sort of a competition for a good thing for everybody around the world through availability of data. But we're very much constrained here because data is not available for every country. As we come to the end, and I'm going to steal another two, two minutes, I want you to leave me with one thought. One thought about the, the SDGs. Start with you, sir, that you want us to think about. I would, practical reality. A practical one. Get people counted to be counted for. We have 2.2 billion people without IDs, without civil registration. We know nothing about them. So that would be a good start. Prime Minister. Talk about a long-term solution to migration. This is one. Leave no one behind, and it is in your own interest. Well, you stole my line, but I'm going to add, we have the tools, the innovation, and we'll get even more innovation as we go forward. So we will get there. And we'll add, oh, well, no, come, no, no, no. come next year for the assessment of the progress. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much.